When I was younger, I spent six years and countless hours not climbing just so I could get this bad boy and become a professional engineer. The profession also comes with a seal of approval. It's hot. It's hot. This video is going to lightly cover uh, a part of physics called determinate statics. The idea is for you to get a cursory understanding and apply it to your climbing. There's also a secret guest cameo in this episode, so please keep watching and discover who it is. I really want to keep making innovative teaching videos, so I hope you'll subscribe and like. And apparently there's a bell somewhere, so click that if you want. And I hope you enjoy. We'll start with this green one to kind of lay down the foundation for the rest of the video. It's a pretty straightforward problem, some big moves between good holds. Once again, you can try guessing the grade before and then after I break it down and see if it's changed and I'll reveal the grades at the end of the video. Okay, let's begin. Statics analysis fundamentally starts with the free body diagram. diagram, diagram. This diagram represents all the forces on a body at a given snapshot in time. As a climber, the main force you reckon with is your weight. In the vertical z-axis, it lays into your body everywhere. To simplify analysis though, visualize it to act at your center of gravity. The direction of the force is depicted in the direction your body would move if it was left unbalanced. So to avoid phasing into the cosmos, you generate additional forces to resist the force of your weight. These forces are created by your hands and feet. If all the forces in that axis equal out, that means your body won't move in that axis and you are in equilibrium. Remember, even though you're pulling downwards, the arrows at the supports are depicted upwards because that's the direction your body would move due to the forces you're applying. So to do a pull up, to overcome the equilibrium in a dead hang, the initial forces you apply at your supports are actually greater than your weight. This all might be obvious, but stick with me, I promise it gets better. The closer your weight is to a support, the greater percentage of your weight is naturally taken by that support. Here, the center of gravity is closer to the right hand. As you move left, the forces redistribute relative to the distance between the weight and that support. Finishing off the analysis, we're adding a third support here, lessening the load on the other two, and finally shifting over enough to have virtually no load on the right hand. And if a support isn't resisting any load, you don't need that support anymore. The idea of shifting your center of gravity towards one support and farther from the other is practiced here to the right, and then once again back towards the left. Okay, it's time to crack on into the next dimension. Like, uh, we're actually talking about the next dimension. Some holds, like the left hand over here, it's only ergonomic to pull in the horizontal x-axis. The direction of pull is to the left, because remember, that's the direction your hand is pulling your center of gravity. Remember equilibrium? It also applies in the x-axis. Now that you've created an imbalance in the x-axis, we need to balance it out. Enter the left foot. Smearing the left foot on the wall creates enough counterforce to balance out the x-axis. And finally, your weight is mostly supported by your right foot, and you have a balance system that doesn't rely on your right hand. Let's see how this move goes without a horizontal balance. Dropping the smearing foot means that when you try to make the next move, there's only one x-axis force coming from your left hand and no opposing force. And you guessed it, your body moves in the direction of the imbalance. By the time you have your hand on the next hold, you'll be creating new forces to try to achieve equilibrium again. So some takeaways from this climb are that your body moves in the direction of the force imbalance, Force naturally distributes relative to support distance, and if you're looking for stability, balance all forces as much as you can. This next climb starts with an undercling, and you move up to some poor side pulls, and you're bumping your way and shimmying up your way up the side pulls. This climb also involves some heel hooks. I cover the concept of good or bad heel hooks in the previous video, so take a look if you'd like. And then a big move, Cutting the swing, 
So I'm faffing around, part of the official way to solve this problem. And finally, two big pull throughs to reach the top. Congrats, you are now ready to consider the final Y axis. The Y axis runs in the direction between you and the wall. Your right hand is pulling your body into the wall due to the angle of the hold. And so you'll use your feet to equalize the force. The next move can then be made with relative equilibrium. Okay, it's time for a curveball. Check out the forces here. In the Z, your weight's quite balanced by your left foot. In the Y axis, your left foot is pushing away from the wall due to the angle of the hold, and it's balanced out by your left hand and right foot pulling your body into the wall. Finally, in the X axis, your left hand pulls left, balanced out by your right foot pulling right. In summary, everything seems to be pretty balanced in all axes, and yet you'll notice you'll have to make this next move pretty quickly or else you'll fall in the middle of it. That's because you just discovered the equilibrium of... Rotation. Any force that doesn't pass directly through a support puts rotation around that support. Let's take a look at the left foot. In the Z direction, the green arrow passes directly through the left foot so it doesn't create rotation. Your weight, however, is at a distance D away from the support and thus will create rotation around that left foot. And if this is left unbalanced, you'll rotate forever in that space. To try to balance out that rotation, you rely on the y-axis forces from your left hand pulling you back clockwise and your right foot. The product of a force and its perpendicular distance from a point of rotation is called the torque. Torque is transmitted through your body between the point of the load and the point of rotation. And it's what climbers often refer to as core or body tension. If you can't hold core tension to make the move in equilibrium, move quickly to the next position where you can establish equilibrium. You'll sometimes find yourself rotating around a point when you fall. The rotational forces may be too much for your body to hold the tension. You can't reduce your weight here, but you can reduce the rotational force created by your weight by minimizing the perpendicular distance to the point of rotation. Applying forces that generate rotation in the other direction also will edge you closer to equilibrium. You are now in a much more rotationally stable position. The rest of this climb is reminiscent of some topics we've already covered. So just one more tidbit before I reveal the secret cameo. Engineering philosophy is to optimize the efficiency of a system. The system here let's say are your hands and feet. Your legs have far more capacity than your arms, so don't waste that capacity. To optimize this system, practice the previous takeaway to shift weight towards components with greater capacity and away from components with lower. So some takeaways here are that your body moves in the direction of the rotational imbalance. Rotation around a point can be reduced by minimizing the distance to the force and be efficient in your climbing by loading your components proportional to their max capacity. Okay, the secret cameo is professional climber Oshima Shiraishi. Hey. <laughs> oh, this is a cameo? Yeah, it's really tiny. I, know. I, I was like, what oh, am I that's looking cool. into? <laughs> She's going to help demonstrate the final climb of today's video. The climb starts off a bit overhung into a series of side pulls. Eventually it morphs into a roof climb. The holds are better here, but a bit sequential, meaning the order you hit them is important. After you establish on the final two crimps, you set your feet and make a big move to a jug, and then resetting your feet. And then Ashima, she fits into this small shape over here to make the final move a big toss to another blocked jug. Before we break down this last climb, let's get some pro tips from the pro climber herself. Shima, what should our viewers do? Hey, make sure you like and subscribe. <laughs> so I did say it was only a cameo, so apologies, uh, it's only going to be me the rest of the video. Anywho, quick free body diagram. My hope is you'll naturally start seeing how to balance a position whenever you look at a climb. Okay, Z axis. Weight balanced by your left foot and both hands. Next, the geometry of the left foot chip forces you to push a bit to the right. Your hands get some extra duty to balance it out. 
The same trouble happens in the y-axis. Due to the overhang, you'll naturally be pushing out a bit with your foot, which means more work for your hands. To minimize these forces, push your hips up into the wall. Although it looks minuscule, getting that much closer to the wall helps ergonomically place your leg to pull upwards more and push outwards less. Additionally, it serves as a physical cue to recruit more body tension and combat rotation around your supports. On the next part, you may have noticed that Shima suss out this move before going back and revising her sequence. Your body's relation to the angle of the hold means most of your strength pulls in a direction you'd have to additionally balance rather than pulling in a direction to balance your weight. The distance between supports also creates a high body tension requirement. Switching your hands to move to a farther but more ergonomic hold and moving your feet up first into a bicycle, reducing the distance and body tension makes the next move more balanced. Bicycles, meaning pinching holds between the top of one foot and the bottom of the other, are a strong technique because they immediately balance out their own opposing forces. In this final section, Ashima manages to put her left foot really close to her body here. This allows her to establish equilibrium before the big move. For me, that left foot is just far too close. Instead, I balance out my hands with a counterforce from a foot far out before the big move. Body morphology obviously plays a big role in how you solve a problem, and I'd love to make a video on it. If that's something you're interested in, let me know in the comments. So I've practically condensed a couple of weeks of intro statics into a 10 minute video. So if anything's confusing, uh, just ask questions and I'll do my best to help. So you're on your way now to becoming a professional engineer yourself and approving your own things. Side. 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 All right, see you later. Side. Without further ado, here are the grades of the climbs. This one is a V4 slash 5. Let me know in the comments if you think it's hard or soft. On a completely unrelated note, I'm working on building emotional resilience by having people call my climb soft, so... This next one is a V6 slash 7. It was quite humidity dependent, so being on the rooftop of a sunny east coast summer is quite a trip. Also a good teacher of making big moves off of insecure holds. And last but not least, this one is also a V6 slash 7. It's always a pleasure to watch Ashima cruise a climb. The footage of my sends are so sloppy, it makes me question why I make these videos at all. So figuring out how to structure this lesson and how deep to go is kind of tough because I don't know if uh, this is interesting to you. So I'd appreciate it if you let me know in the comments. And if this video sucked, let me know in the comments. I have more ideas that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. So I hope you'll subscribe and I shall see you in the next one.